Thank you. Please be seated. Well, again, let me give you a very warm welcome on this last day of 1995. On this Sunday morning, so many people have, uh, have asked me over the past few days, what day is it today? And I think that's because the days seem to pass very, very quickly here. And uh, we're having such a good time that we're actually uh, not remembering the actual day. But it's the last day of the year, and today is Sunday. And uh, in a few moments, Reflex are going to uh, sing a song to us that reminds us that this is the Lord's Day. It is Sunday morning, and we come into His presence to give Him praise and to bring our thanksgiving to Him. But before they sing and before we hear some information about today, let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord, it's good to be here this morning, and as we look back over this uh, past year, we want to thank you for all your goodness and all your faithfulness to us. And we come to you this morning to lift up our hearts in praise and to recognize your kingship and to recognize your lordship. Lord, as today we consider what it means to understand the times in which we live and as in a few moments we turn to your word, so we ask that by your Spirit you will give us understanding and that you will open our hearts to be responsive to you. Lord, I pray that as we come to Mission 96, that what we hear will sink into our hearts and, and make us different. Above all, we pray that we might be more like you so that our testimony as we leave this place will be strong, and that our commitment to serving you will be such that will bless your heart. Be with us today. Grant us ears that will hear and hearts open to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yvonne, good morning. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Okay. The lunchtime concerts are really great. Today, music uh, will be by rock musician Bill Drake. Go and hear his really exciting program. And tomorrow, the Stankoffs will be there along with Gloria Jordan, another great program. Today, we start our prayer chain. Many of the 15 minute groups sections have been taken, but there are a few gaps. Why don't you go after this program to the prayer chain and set your name on the list? You are very needed to pray for the world. So let's go over now to Martin and Reflex for another wonderful song. Only He is 
Bible reading today is taken from Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 11. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly impurity to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Good morning. <clears throat> Let's turn now to Paul's letter to the Colossians again. We're going to be looking into chapter 2 and chapter 3 this morning. <clears throat> Shortly before the Lord Jesus went to the cross, he spent a few special hours with his disciples and he gave them some final instructions and he prayed for them. 
I'm referring, of course, to what we call in our Bibles the Upper Room Discourse. During the course of that meeting, the Lord Jesus prayed for his disciples, and I always encourage people who are disciples of Jesus to study that passage of Scripture, to find out what his instructions were and to find out what he prayed for us. In John chapter 17, he said three very, very important things. He explained to the disciples that the Father was taking him out of the world, but he was leaving the disciples in the world. Then he explained to them that whilst they were going to be left in the world, they were not of the world. But having said that he was leaving them in the world, and they were not of the world, he then said, you are sent to the world. Now I want you to try and remember those three little expressions. They're very important. Jesus said his disciples were, number one, left in the world. Number two, they are not of the world. Number three, they are sent to the world. Now that's basically what I wanted to tell you this morning, but I do have a few minutes left, so let me talk a little bit more about those three things. It's not too difficult to concentrate on one of these things, or perhaps even two of them. But it is a challenge to think in terms of all three. For instance, to be left in the world. The Lord Jesus had explained that the world was hostile to him. It hated him. And the Lord Jesus said, if it hated me, it's quite possible it will hate you too. And so he was telling the disciples right from the beginning, you are going to be left in a difficult situation. In fact, he told them, in the world you will have trouble. That was encouraging, wasn't it? Peter was one of the disciples who heard him say that, and sometime later he wrote his epistle. And he said to the Christians who were having a hard time, don't be surprised that you're having a hard time. This is what Jesus told us would happen. It's not easy to be a Christian in the world. Now, some Christians immediately say, well, if I can only be a Christian in the world where it's going to be difficult, I don't want any part of it. Some say, well, I know that I'm called to be a Christian in the world, but what does it mean that I'm not of the world? If I'm left in it, but I'm not of it, then I must withdraw. So I will be a nun. I will go into a monastery. Or I will just spend all my time with Christians. And I will not go near the world. If they say that, of course, they're missing something very important. If they are not to spend any time in contact with the world, what was the point of leaving them in it? So what we have to work out is, how can I be in it and not of it? But then some people say, well, the world is so difficult, I must be on my guard all the time. I must be very, very careful wherever I go, whatever I do. If they spend their time on the defensive, then how can they be sent to it? You see, the more you think about it, the more of a problem it becomes. 
And I think that any young Christian today living in Europe has to acknowledge that living in Europe as a Christian today is not easy. There are many, many difficulties, but we are not allowed to withdraw because we are sent to, we're placed in, but we're not of this society. We're here to be different and to make a difference. Now let me try and illustrate this for you. Many years ago, there was a war in Korea, and I got a very nice letter from the British government which said, Dear Stuart, we have a war in Korea. We wonder if you would come and help us with it. And I said, okay. So I went and I joined the Royal Navy. I became a member of the Royal Marines. One of the things I learned in my training was that on board ship, you sometimes have a fire and that can be very dangerous. So we had to learn how to put out a fire on board ship. So we were on a ship. They started a big fire down in a closed compartment. It was very, very hot, thick black smoke, very, very dangerous. But we had special apparatus, special gear. We had an air supply. And we walked into this fire among all this black smoke, but somebody outside was pumping the air to us. And as we went in, we breathed the air from outside, even though we were among the flames and the smoke. And once we got inside, we then put the fire out. So what was our situation? We were in it, but we were not of it, but we were sent to it. Now, of course, being young and foolish, we decided to have some fun. And so as our colleagues would go into the fire, we would pump the air to them through the pipe, but we stood on the pipe. And so everybody thought we were pumping, but there was no air going in. And it was wonderful to see how quickly they came out. <laughs> you see, you can be in it, and you can be sent to it, but if you've not got your source of supply not from it, you'll be in trouble. So what do we have to do? We have to learn what our society is alike. We have to understand where it is different from what it means to be Christian. We must show the difference between what we are and what the society stands for, but we must go to the society in order to bring about change. Now, with that in mind, let's look at what Paul told the Christians in Colossae. First of all, in chapter 2, starting with verse 16, he describes the particular situation in Colossae. He talks about the difficulties that the Colossian Christians will experience. And some of the difficulties they experienced are similar to the experiences that we have today. Some of them were quite different. One of the main concerns that Paul has for the Colossian Christians is this. There were people who were giving all kinds of spiritual, religious teaching that was not centered in Christ. And he points out that this is very, very dangerous. Did you know that there are many people in our society, in the world today, who will talk about spirituality, who will be interested in religion, 
but they are not committed to Christ. They will have all kinds of different things that they regard as important, but a commitment to Jesus as personal Savior and personal Lord and personal indwelling dynamic is not what their spirituality is about. Now, you know as well as I do that there are many traditional religions in Europe. Many of them started out well, but over the years, they have moved away from Christ. And in the position that Christ is supposed to occupy, they have put all kinds of rules, all kinds of rituals, all kinds of regulations. And as far as those religious people are concerned, as long as you keep the rules, as long as you obey the regulations, as long as you fulfill the rituals, that's all they're interested in. And it is possible to go through this kind of religious experience and never trust Christ as your Savior and never acknowledge Him as your Lord and never enjoy His indwelling presence. Now, that was one of the dangers in Colossae. It is one of the dangers in Europe today. Some of the things that were going on in Colossae, the Apostle Paul says, are simply a shadow, but Christ is the reality. Now, as I have traveled all over the world, one of the things that has been very interesting to me is to notice how in different countries, people have different traditions, different religious rules and regulations. And very often, people are not concerned about whether you know Christ. They're concerned about whether you keep their rules or not. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was in Berlin, Germany. I preached in a church there, quite close to the wall that in those days divided the East from the West. After the morning service, <clears throat> I went to have lunch with the pastor, Klaus Eickhoff, and his wife, Renata. They gave me some good German food, bratwurst and sauerkraut, and they gave me a glass of liquid. I looked at this glass of liquid, and my friend Klaus saw me looking at the glass of liquid. He spoke very little English. I spoke very little German. We had difficulty communicating. He said to me, pointing to the glass of liquid, you drink beer? I said, oh, nein, danke, nein, nein. No, thank you. No, thank you. Why you not drink beer? He asked me. I said, oh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, English Christians don't drink beer. <laughs> and number two, I don't like it. As soon as I'd said it, I thought, uh-uh. <laughs> now he's going to say, English Christians drink not beer. You, English Christian, you drink not beer. How you know you not like it? <laughs> Fortunately, he wasn't quick enough. <laughs> he said, I am astounded. That is one of the first English words that Germans learn when they're with the English. I am astounded. He turned to his wife and he said, Renate, wir wollen beten. We will pray. So she put down her glass of liquid 
And she put her hands together, and this was his prayer. I thank you, God. I am German Christian. <laughs> so now we have a problem. Now we have a problem. Because in England, the English good Christian drinks not beer, but in Germany, the good Christian sometimes has beer with his Bible study. <laughs> now then, what do we do? Let me tell you about the Dutch Christians. <laughs> the Dutch Christians were concerned about the church in America. So they sent some elders to America to look at the church there. And they came back with their report. Oh, they said, the church in America is in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> the Christians there drive big cars. They wear expensive clothes. The women wear makeup <laughs> and jewelry. They have cushions on their pews in the church. They have carpets on the floor. Not only do they have an organ, they have a piano as well. They spend so much money on themselves. The American church is in deep, deep trouble. And you know, some of those Dutch elders were so worried that as they heard this news about the church in America, they burst into tears. And the tears ran down their cigars into their beer. <laughs> so, who is spiritual? Is it the Germans? Is it the Dutch? Is it the Americans? No, it's the British. <laughs> you see, the point is this. These things are not unimportant. Please don't misunderstand me. We must have our convictions about these things. But what is important is Christ and our relationship to Him. One of the things that is so difficult for Christians living in this world is that sometimes we will have a religious situation where there is form and there is order and there are rules, but there is no living Christ. But then there's another problem. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul talks about not setting our minds on earthly things. And in verse 5, he talks about our earthly nature. So if we have problems from a dead orthodoxy, we have another problem. It is this, that there are many wonderful things in this world earthly things that God has made and He has given to us richly to enjoy, but we can become so interested in these earthly things that we become more interested in them than in Christ Himself. And this is a great, great danger. Jesus talked about this in his Sermon on the Mount. You remember what he said? He said, Now do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. For if you lay up all these treasures on earth, if you spend all your time and your energy on earthly things, what will happen? Well, he said, if you get a lot of clothes, the moths might get them. 
If you get a lot of valuable things, rust might get them. If you have lots of money and jewels, thieves might get them. And suddenly you discover that everything that was important to you is gone, and then you die and go to heaven, and you discover you lost all your earthly valuables, and you had nothing of value in heaven. You see, one of the difficulties about being a Christian is this that whilst the world in which we live is hostile to Christ, there are many good things in it. And it is legitimate for us to enjoy them, but if we're not careful, we can be so interested in them that we lose sight of Christ. One of the wonderful things that is happening in America at the present time is that America is at last discovering what football is. The rest of the world has known for a long time, but America is now discovering that football is a game where you put your foot on the ball. <laughs> it's wonderful. Now the Americans are going about football the way they go about everything. Careful training, best facilities, well organized, and the result is that there are thousands upon thousands of young people now in teams, and they are learning how to play football. My grandsons are very good football players. They have been in teams since they were six or seven years of age. I'm excited to see this happening. But do you know what is happening now? Many of the families in our church are so excited to have their children in football programs. They're doing so well in their football programs that they now, unfortunately, have less and less time for church. So if at the same time there is worship on the Lord's Day and there is football for their children, guess what? Oh, sorry, we can't be at worship today. We have football for our children. Does that mean football is wrong? No, the English invented it. It can't be wrong. <laughs> Does it mean that football is good? Of course it is. It came out of England. It must be good. Well, then what is the problem? The problem is that we will often have good earthly things that are quite legitimate that will become more important to us than the things of the spirit and eternity. It's difficult. There's another problem. We have what the Apostle Paul calls an earthly nature. Now, it would be very nice if when you become a Christian, you were immediately perfect. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No more sin, no more temptation, no more problems. You just become an angel. <laughs> you begin to grow feathers on your hands. You have a halo on your head and you have a bright golden smile on your face. <laughs> that would be wonderful. It doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, even though we have become new people in Christ, we still have an earthly nature. So we have a problem. We can be surrounded by a dead religion we can have a world full of things that will take Christ's place, and inside us we have an attitude that is often drawn away from God, so that we want the things that we should not want, we desire the things that we ought not to desire, we do what we should not, and we leave and done what we ought. Put all that together, and what is the result? We can have desires that are immoral. 
we can have attitudes that are wrong. And if our desires are immoral and our attitudes are wrong, and we live in an environment that is hostile to Christ, and we have only a religion of shadows and no reality of Christ, we can find ourselves with a form of religion, but no life and no power. And that is what Paul is concerned about. So to be a Christian left in the world means that you have to face up to many problems. Now here's the second thing. We are left in this situation because this is where God wants us to live out our Christianity. If he had wanted us to be Christians in heaven only, guess what? The moment we were converted, we'd have gone straight to heaven. It would have been an interesting thing to watch. We would have had an evangelistic crusade, and the evangelist at the end would invite those who wanted to trust Christ to come forward. And as they came forward, they would stand at the front, and all of a sudden they'd go, <laughs> and they've gone to heaven. The only problem would be, how come the evangelist is still here? You say, oh, well, God decided to take the rest to heaven and just leave evangelists down here. No. He leads us to himself and leaves us all here. This is where we do our Christianity. This is where we live as Christians. But we live in this situation differently from those who do not know Christ. Now, notice about five or six things that describe what has happened to the Christian, that makes them different from the society in which they live. You'll notice, first of all, in verse 1 of chapter 3, you have been raised with Christ. In verse 3, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, all those little phrases are very important. We need to understand what they mean. First of all, verse 3, you died. Did you know that? Did you know that when you became a Christian, you died? He said, no. No, I didn't know that. Well, let me tell you about it. We all understand how that Christ died for us. We understand that. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth. We know that when Christ died on the cross, he was bearing the penalty of our sin. And when we commit ourselves to him, we are totally forgiven. And God looks upon us as if we had never sinned. And Christ's death becomes the means of our forgiveness. Christ died for us. But there's another truth. When Christ died for us, we died with him. It's important we understand this. When Christ died for us, we died with him. Now, what does that mean? Look at it this way. Were there some things in your life that you have done that made it necessary for Christ to die for you? you commit, did you commit any sins? You say, yeah. Was it necessary if those sins were forgiven for Christ to die? You say, yes. Well, then you did some things that made it necessary for Christ to die for you, right? You say, right. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that once you had done things 
that it was necessary for Christ to die for, once you're forgiven, you can go on living in them. You say, oh God, you know, I did some stuff that was so wrong. It was so bad. I am so ashamed. I confess it. I repent of it. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying for me. It's wonderful. Now I'm forgiven. Now I'll go back and do it all over again. Can you do that? No. You see, I am no longer free to live in what it was necessary for Christ to die for. Let me say that again. I am no longer free to live in what it was necessary for Christ to die for. So Christ died for my sins, but I have died to those sins now, for I am no longer free to live in what it was necessary for Christ to die for. This is a truth that needs to be emphasized over and over again. But you say, my problem is this. I know the things I did wrong. I am so glad that Christ died for them. And I know that I should no longer live in what it was necessary for him to die for. But I have a problem. I keep going back to those things. They are so powerful. They are so strong. I do not have the power not to go on living that way. Well, now we need to understand the second thing. Not only is it that we died with him, but listen, we were raised with him in newness of life. For Christ not only died for us, he rose again for us, and he lives in the power of an endless life. So the Apostle Paul now says, Christ is our life. What does that mean? It means that when I come to acknowledge Christ, I not only acknowledge him as having died for me, and I learn that I died with him, it also means I know I've been raised into new life, and the new life is the life of the living Lord Jesus indwelling me in the person of the Holy Spirit. So Christ is my life. You see, Christianity is not me trying to keep a lot of rules. Christianity is me being made anew through the death and resurrection of Christ. I have been raised in him. Christ is my life. He is the new power. He is the new dynamic. He is the new enabling for my whole new experience. But not only that, he goes on to say this, verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Christ died for me. I died with him. Christ was raised. I was raised with him. Christ is my life. And one day he will return in great glory. And guess what? I will appear with him, glorified with him part of his eternal kingdom, and having been faithful to him in life, he will give me a position of great glory and honor and responsibility for all eternity. Now put all that together, and you learn something. You learn why you are different from the society in which you live. You died with Christ. You were raised with Christ. Christ is your life. 
You are thinking in terms of eternity. You are heading for glory. You are a new person. You have become in Christ something totally new and exciting. And all around you is a society full of people who don't know Christ. So, you're left among them, but you're not of them. So what do you do? You say, oh, well, here I am. I'm left among them. I'm not of them. I'm going to have to protect myself against them. Make sure I'm okay. And wait for Jesus to come in glory and rescue me from this terrible place. No! You're left in it, not of it, but sent to it. What does that mean? It means we are sent into this world to be different. Why? Because we have been made different. It isn't now that we have a list of rules and regulations. It is that we have been made new. We're left in a situation that is so different. Now having been made new, we go out and live as new people. Usually when it comes to religion, people think, if I can keep enough rules and do enough good things, I will be all right in the end. So I will do this, and I will be that, and I will become what I want to become. That's how people usually think. And the Christian says, no, it's the other way around. God works in your life through Christ, and you become something totally new. Then you learn how to be what you have become. Let me illustrate it. One day I got married. I reported at the appropriate time at the front of the church. I had hired a suit. I looked like a penguin. <laughs> I stood there, and then a young lady in a very beautiful white dress came and stood beside me. The minister said a whole lot of things to me, and then he nodded, and I said, I do because he told me that's what I should say. <laughs> I do. Then he turned to the young lady and he said a whole lot of things to her and she said, I do. <laughs> At that moment, something very dramatic happened. He took my hand and he took her hand and he held them and he said, whom God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. And I realized something. I had become a husband. <laughs> All it took was a rented suit, <laughs> 10 minutes in church, and saying, I do. That was it. It wasn't difficult. As we came out of the church, all the people were there, they started throwing rice at us. They hadn't even cooked the rice. I thought, what a stupid thing to do, throw rice at us. There was a very nice car there waiting for us. I got inside the car looking still like a penguin. <laughs> the young lady sat beside me, and the most awful thought occurred to me. You know what it was? I have become a husband. <laughs> but I have no idea how to be a husband. I'd never been one before. 
I had become, but I didn't know how to be what I had become. But God had thought of it, and He had given me a wonderful teacher, my wife. And for the last 37 years, she has been teaching me how to be what I have become. Now listen, my young friends. This society that we live in has many things that are hostile to Christ, but it's where you're called to live your Christianity. You're left in it. But because you are new creatures in Christ, you're not of it, but you're sent to it. And you go to it learning to be what you have become. And your new lifestyle is different, it's beautiful, it's attractive, it's powerful, and as you live in your society, God sends you to it as an agent of change. He said that we were light in a dark place. He said that we are the salt of the earth. What a privilege it is to be left in it, not of it, and sent to it. And what a joy it is to be able to talk to you about it this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for these thousands of young people from all over Europe and beyond who live in circumstances that often are hostile to God. Thank you that you've placed them there strategically. Thank you that you have made them new in Christ, that they've died with Christ, they've been raised with him. Christ is their life, and they are thinking of glory and eternity, and they're creatures of your coming kingdom. Thank you that they're learning to be what they have become. Take them back to their places of influence. Send them there to be agents of change. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just a, just a quick reminder, Stuart and Jill will be in the bookshop at uh, 6.30 this evening until 8 o'clock to meet you and to sign their books. And a reminder about the three books last night, Secrets uh, to, of Spiritual Stamina, 72 Workouts from the Book of Colossians, written by Stuart, and the book from Jill, Running on Empty, Refilling Your Spirit in the Low Points uh, of Your Life and uh, Looking to Christ. And the last one, The Fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of um, the Spirit from Colossians 5, 22 to 23, actually talking about the Christian behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Well, our day now is well underway, and we want to encourage you to move as quickly as possible to your next sessions. Could we just say one thing as far as the technical aspect of our presentation is concerned here? Um, in, in the hall. We would ask, please, that you don't use flash photography during the sessions because that actually disturbs the technical facility and also disturbs people around you and it makes it quite difficult, particularly in things like the mime. So if you'd uh, mind helping us in that, we'd really appreciate it. Please, no flash photography during the sessions here um, in the mornings and in the evenings. Have a good day and we look forward to seeing you later. God bless you.